But first, while it's hard not to be absorbed in the offence in the United States, events, of course, which Australians can't influence, I want to return to events closer to home, which we can. Tomorrow, the Cote inquiry into Victoria's disastrous hotel quarantine program led to 800 deaths and a lockdown of the state. Well, it will deliver its interim report. On the back of this report, the Premier wants to restart hotel quarantine so that international travellers and foreign students, a big source of income, of course, to Victoria, can return to Melbourne before Christmas, he says. Yet aren't we just risking another calamity to resume hotel quarantine before we know exactly what went wrong last time? And doesn't that mean Jennifer Coate doing her job fully and recalling key witnesses to ask questions about what they should have been asked about already. All of that yet hasn't happened. On Tuesday night, the former Deputy Labor leader, that's right, Labor leader in the Senate, Stephen Conroy, told me that the Cote inquiry had to reopen its investigations. I think it's getting harder and harder uh, for Coates to sustain not calling witnesses. I mean, today's email's a bombshell. Uh, I mean, you've got the public servant saying, I don't even have verbal authority or instruction to do this. And I'm going to put an electronic signature on and I'm going to witness as if it's been signed in front of me. And today in the Australian newspaper, the former Commonwealth Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions, Mark Legrand, wrote that, and I quote, without a wholesale reopening of the inquiry, its actions, quote, may appear to many to be partial and patently flawed. That's right, not impartial and certainly patently flawed. Now, there's no way that anyone can have confidence in any report Cote brings down without the inquiry re-examining two key witnesses, Premier Daniel Andrews and former Health Minister Jenny Makarkos. Let's not forget that Makarkos surrendered her political career, not just her ministry, in protest at what the Premier told the inquiry. She didn't just resign as health minister, she quit the parliament entirely in disgust because she could no longer work with a premier whose testimony, she said, she strongly disagreed with. And in a subsequent submission to the inquiry, Makarkos accused the premier of subverting, subverting the cabinet process and said that his evidence should be treated with, I quote, caution. Now, the whole problem with the code inquiry she said, was that there had been no proper cross-examination of witnesses. And on that, Jenny Makarkos is absolutely right. Indeed, when she set up the practice rules for her inquiry, and these rules differ from one inquiry to another, Jennifer Coate disallowed cross-examination of witnesses, unless, of course, special leave was granted. As a result, cross-examination has rarely happened in the Cote inquiry. Now, it seems utterly bizarre to me that a former minister needs to tell Cote how to run a proper inquiry, but that's the crux of what the Makarkos submission says. Jenny Makarkos says, and I quote, the board should critically review the evidence of the Premier and ministers, where that's at odds with other evidence, and in particular, where it departs from contemporaneous documents. It's implausible, Makarkas continued, to assert in the words of the inquiry's closing submission that the use of private security was not really a decision at all, but rather was arrived at by way of a creeping assumption that took hold over a period of a couple of hours and wasn't questioned by anyone. With respect, said Makarkas, such a submission has insufficient regard to the realities of governmental operations and decision-making. Now, you've heard me say that too from day one. But if someone like Makarkos, someone who was there in the room when many of these decisions were made, is being ignored when she says, recall me to the stand, and that doesn't happen, then serious questions must be asked about the integrity of the process that we're all relying on to get to the bottom of this mess. And just how good will any report be in terms of opening the state up to international travellers once again if they haven't come to grips with what went so disastrously wrong last time in Victoria? Now, to be honest, 
I find the Makaka submission extraordinary because she's basically giving council assisting all the advice needed to resolve what this inquiry set out to discover in the first place. Who made the decision to use private security in Victoria's hotel quarantine and who was therefore considered responsible for the loss of 800 plus lives, the house arrest of 5 million Melburnians and the economic destruction of so many small businesses. As Makarkos said, as plainly as only someone in the engine room of all of these decisions can, and I quote, the weight of evidence points clearly to an actual decision, not an assumed one, having been made during the course of, or soon after, the meeting of National Cabinet. She's talking here, of course, about Friday the 27th of March, and that period of time when we know Chris Eccles, the Premier's now former top bureaucrat, leaving the meeting of the National Cabinet to get the hotel quarantine program underway urgently, he said, because so much needed to happen so quickly. And he left the meeting before the meeting had even concluded. Now, all of that was around 12 noon. He walked out, he spoke to the Premier's Chief of Staff and then the Jobs Secretary, Simon Femister. And we know by 1.22pm that Victoria had decided not to use police or army, but to go down the path of private security. And we know that because that's when Police Chief Graham Ashton told his counterpart in Canberra, all good, Victoria Police won't be guarding these quarantine hotels, we've got a special deal out of our DPC or Department of Premier and Cabinet. Now, I don't think I can make it any clearer for council assisting, can I? You want to know when the decision was made for Victoria to go it alone, to use private security and put in train a series of events that have cost this state dearly in terms of blood and treasure? Well, there it is. That window between 12 noon and 1.22 p.m. Now, you ask yourself, who could have made that decision to use private security while National Cabinet was actually underway or immediately afterwards without any Victorian Cabinet process? There's only one person, you and I know that, and that person is the Premier himself. To make this point even more obvious in her submission, McCarkas put the whole question beyond doubt but she said that this sort of go-it-alone decision to use private security rather than police and military would have to be, and I quote, a considered choice at an elevated level of government. Now, Makakos might be wrong. She might have an axe to grind. Or she might just be telling the truth in an inquiry where the truth-telling has been in short supply. But we'll never know... We'll never know, will we, unless both she and the Premier are recalled to the witness stand so that these issues can be hammered out through careful cross-examination. It just seems plain wrong to me that any report, even an interim report, is brought down by the Cote Inquiry tomorrow before these witnesses are recalled. How can something that cost 800 lives and tens of thousands of Victorians their livelihoods be started up again until we properly understand what went so wrong last time? And how can we let any government get away with collective amnesia when the price paid is the lives of 800 of our most vulnerable? Now, contrast this coat inquiry with the Royal Commission into Victoria's Black Saturday bushfires. Back then, with the Black Saturday Royal Commission, there was a real determination to find the truth to learn what they got wrong and for those mistakes never to happen again. In that 2009 Royal Commission, there was only Team Victoria. Every minister and every department but for Victoria Police, well, they were represented by the one legal team, headed up by a very serious legal heavyweight, Mr Alan Myers QC, and a battery of barristers to support him. Have a look at your screen now. Here's how Team Victoria looked in that Royal Commission. And now, here's the legal spend worth many millions on coat. 
There's no team Victoria with coat. It's every minister and every department for themselves. Literally millions and millions of taxpayer dollars spent to try and shift the blame from one minister to another, from one department to another. Not an inquiry to find out the truth, but an inquiry where the politicians are invested in obscuring the truth. And this is even though we're told that the Cote inquiry was meant to be short, sharp and timely, so that we didn't waste time learning the lessons of what went wrong. In Cote, we've got 28 QCs and junior barristers, all costing tens of thousands of dollars a day, plus many more spent on legal firms to instruct them. Now, I've costed it up. It's well into tens of millions of dollars. And I wouldn't be surprised if the taxpayer ends up paying more for the politicians to be represented at the Cote Inquiry than the cost of the whole Cote Inquiry itself. Now, tonight, I don't want to diminish the significance of what's happening across the Pacific. It's important for what it means for the leadership of the free world. There's no doubt about that. But here at home, our democracy is challenged by a government short on the truth, a Premier that doesn't like tough questions, and an inquiry that's a long way from holding anyone to account. I just do not accept, I will not accept, that the lives of 800 Victorians are treated as though they were virtually meaningless. Now, if that's the new standard for government in this country, it's a new low that no Australian will ever be able to walk back from. If a code inquiry can't or won't do its job, then the only way for justice must be a Royal Commission called by the Prime Minister. And the demands for this from inside the Liberal Party and amongst party faithful and supporters, let me tell you, it is only growing louder.